Good afternoon, everyone. We're glad you could join us today as we continue our webinar series on gene therapy. My name is Katie Kowalski, and I work in the Educational Programs Department at NORD. I look forward to being your host for today's webinar, The Science Behind Gene Therapy. We're happy to have all of you with us today, along with our distinguished speakers. As part of our cost-free educational webinar offering, we're providing a five-part series on gene therapy. NORD is pleased to collaborate with the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy to provide this series. ASGCT is a highly regarded, reputable authority on gene therapy. We're working together to bring you accurate and accessible information on gene therapy. Today's webinar is brought to you with support from Avro Bio, Bluebird Bio, Sarepta Therapeutics, and Amicus Therapeutics. NORD is an independent organization focused on improving the lives of people with rare diseases. We do this through education, research, and advocacy, and patient services. You can learn more about NORD's programs, services, and resources on our website at rarediseases.org. You can also follow NORD on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Tiffany Lucas is an FDA product reviewer in the Division of Gene Therapy in the Center for Biologics, Evaluation, and Research. Her postdoctoral training involved viruses and innate immunology. She earned her PhD in microbiology, investigating the engineering of retroviral gene therapy vectors and the assembly of retroviruses. Dr. Sven Keeley is principal at Sven Keeley Consulting. He provides consulting services to regenerative medicine companies on company formation, clinical development, and commercialization. He was previously the head of development for the Cell and Gene Therapy Division of GlaxoSmithKline, where he led teams who were developing gene therapies for a variety of rare genetic disorders. Dr. Keeley trained as an orthopedic surgeon in the UK and South Africa. We thank you both for being here, and with that, I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Tiffany Lucas. Thank you very much for the warm welcome today. As introduced, I'm a reviewer for gene therapy products at the FDA in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and I'm here to give you an FDA and former research scientist perspective on the science that's used to develop safe and effective gene therapy products. As mentioned, our second speaker, Dr. Sen Keeley, who's a physician, We'll be providing a clinical and patient perspective to gene therapy science. We both hope that after our presentations, you'll be able to better understand gene therapy science from both the product and the clinical patient perspectives. It's my pleasure to present the science behind gene therapy, design, manufacturing, and production. I'll be discussing how gene therapy products are developed, including an introduction to gene therapy science, how products are designed and produced, and how the FDA uses a science-based approach in review and approval of gene therapy products. So what is a gene therapy? I provided a formal definition of how we define gene therapy products at the FDA. However, a more simple understanding might be that gene therapy products work by activity of transfer of genetic material, like DNA, or by altering human genetic sequences. And this can be done directly in the body or to cells outside of the body. We'll get into that later. Gene therapy can potentially address many indications, which I've shown here in the pie chart. Many of you listening today who are personally experiencing a rare disease may be particularly interested in monogenetic diseases, which are those that can be attributed to a single gene, and cancer diseases. Many of these shown here are rare cancer diseases. These two indications comprise a majority of current trials for gene therapy around the world. Gene therapy products can be delivered by two different approaches, and Dr. Keeley will talk about this further later, either directly to the patient, which is called in vivo, or by an external approach, which we call ex vivo, that involves removing cells from the patient, treating those cells with a gene therapy, and then administering the cells back to the patient. In my presentation, I will focus on how we develop the product, and Dr. Keeley will later discuss how these approaches work in the clinic. We all have genomes that encode information for everyday activities of our cells and bodies. In a normal case, let's just make up an example where a gene encodes instructions to make a protein we'll call cat. The letters shown here represent the part of your genome, which is the code, and the message is shown in red. We all have some mutations in our genomes. 
But when these occur in important genes, this can result in problems. When these instructions include some of the examples shown here. So I'm showing you three example mutations where things can go wrong. Um, one, where we're no longer coding our cat protein, we're coding a totally different new animal, a mouse. One, where a gene instructs nothing, and therefore no protein is produced. Or a potential mutation that instructs too many messages, where we have multiple cats produced. So how can gene therapy address these issues? Gene therapies can work in the following simplified ways I'm showing here in orange. A gene therapy can potentially insert a corrected gene or a portion of a gene, or in the case of genome editing, they can silence or correct a gene. So in the examples shown, um, the first two mutations add back production of a cat. And in the last example with genome editing, we are silencing part of that expression and only getting the appropriate level of expression of a cat. Now that we've looked at some background on what a gene therapy product can potentially do in a simplified form, you might see that there are many approaches to gene therapy. Common gene therapy products may include plasmids, which are essentially small circles of DNA, engineered viruses, bacteria, modified cells outside of the human body, or gene-edited cells. Let's take a minute to talk about gene editing products. Science has discovered that nature has many gene editing tools for cutting DNA and enzymes. And the most recent discovery added to the toolbox is the CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme system, which was discovered in bacteria. Scientists can use tools to develop products that target a specific gene in your genome and deliver a therapeutic package to that gene sequence. The technology is able to work because our bodies have a natural repair machinery to patch these breaks in the DNA that occur during gene editing or naturally when mistakes are made during cell division or cells are harmed by environmental factors such as UV damage. Gene editing can be used for many approaches such as disruption of a harmful gene, such as in Huntington's disease, an activation of a normal gene that perhaps is used by a chronic infectious virus, or to engineer a cell to have enhanced therapeutic effects, such as supercharging an immune cell. I would like to note that CRISPR gene editing approaches are still in the early stages of scientific and clinical development. In this pie chart, I am showing you the types of gene therapy vectors that are currently being investigated in global studies. As you can see by this chart, there are many approaches in gene therapy. Each one of these slices is what we call a vector, and most of these are what we call viral vectors. As you can see, there are many approaches, each with pros and cons. But let's talk about what a vector is because this is very important in the product design. Vectors are gene therapy delivery systems. They are made by engineering viruses, bacteria, or pure, pure DNA circles, which we call plasmids, although there are other approaches. They are engineered to carry and deliver a replacement gene or to carry a message to help silence or help an existing gene, as we discussed in our cat example earlier. Two common examples of viral vectors are retroviruses, which include lentiviruses, and adeno-associated viruses, or AAVs, as I'll call them for short. Every vector has strengths and weaknesses. For example, retroviruses permanently integrate into your genome, where they can carry with them large genes during delivery. But there's limited control over where they integrate into your genome, and they're there forever. AAVs deliver a gene therapy DNA that sits against the genome, but doesn't typically integrate. They have a smaller gene carrying capacity and may have a long lasting therapeutic effect. So, how do viral vectors know where to go? These are all considerations that go into the product design. And they have a lot to do with how these vectors are engineered to go to desired cells or tissues. Gene therapy products are designed based on route of delivery, such as in vivo or ex vivo administration. And vectors are engineered to go to specific tissues or may only turn on in selected cells. The dose may be scaled up or down depending on how your organs or your immune system respond to the vector. All of these components of vector design are reviewed by the FDA for safety and efficacy, and they're all highly product dependent. So what makes viral vectors safe? And how do we use science to design safe gene therapy vectors? This is obviously an important question. First, wild viruses, the kind that make us sick, have their own genomes. 
With several decades of research, science has learned that we can remove most of the virus's genome and replace it with therapeutic genes. We can still use the virus's natural ability to get into our cells, which is required for delivery of the gene therapy agent. But instead of making you sick, the viruses can then deliver our genetic message to your cells. Imagine a viral vector is like an address package, where the original letter inside has been removed and we've replaced it with our own message. The envelope is still addressed and knows where to go to deliver our message with a therapeutic gene. This is critical to get new genes into our cells of interest. The FDA reviews data to support that the viruses can't replicate. Although I will note there are a few products with replication competent viruses which typically deliver their therapeutic effect and are later cleared by the immune system. When gene therapy and gene edited products are designed, they are designed with consideration for multiple factors, including four I have listed here which include avoidance of adverse genetic events like mutations that could be caused by off-target effects or imprecise DNA repair, unknown biological consequences due to the complexities of cells and tissues, and nonspecific activity where gene therapy or genome editing may be delivered to the wrong address. Gene therapies are also engineered to have appropriate immune responses, not too much or not too little depending on the product. Let's take a closer look at production of two viral vector products, the first being an AAV or adeno-associated virus product. On the right is an image of a large-scale bioreactor where cells are grown to produce the AAV vector. The pink area contains 70 liters of cell culture media, and inside is a complex webbed 500 meter squared surface area of microscopic plastic for growing cells to produce AAV. Production begins by delivering the genetic instructions for making AAV into the host cells, which I'm showing you under manufacturing steps. Um, these cells, which are going to produce the AAV, may be animal or insect cells. The virus is grown in a bioreactor under controlled sterile conditions for about three to five days, and then cells are disrupted. The virus is collected and goes through multiple purification and concentration steps before final formulation of the gene therapy product that would be administered to the patient. The whole process from thawing cells to final testing of the lot can take one to two months depending on the product. And again, these are very product specific. There's a lot that goes into manufacturing gene therapy products, so I'd like to give everyone some numbers with examples. Remember that 500 meter squared plastic web that grows the cells? Well, that surface area is about the size of a tenth of an American football field. Within a unit like this, about one times 10 to the 17th AEV particles can be made. That's a lot of zeros that I've shown here for size. The 70-liter tank holds about as much liquid as 140 soda bottles dispensed from a vending machine, if you can imagine that. Bioreactors can range in size from as small as 1 liter to 2,000 liters, depending on clinical trial phase or intended drug product. A single patient may need about 1 times 10 to the 14th AAV particles in a treatment per kilogram, although, although this is very dependent on the individual product. And I provided some numbers for a hypothetical dose for a smaller adult or a child that you can see here. It takes a lot of effort to produce a single dose of a gene therapy product. Next, let's look at an ex vivo gene therapy product called CAR-T. The process is very similar in manufacturing for hematopoietic stem cells or bone marrow drive cells, which are essentially like very young immune cells. There are two parts to this gene therapy product. On the left-hand side, you'll see manufacturing steps for the lentiviral vector or retroviral vector, which is similar to the AAV example I just provided. The vector is grown in large volumes by cell culture in cell lines. The virus is harvested and purified, tested, and then applied to the T cell. However, you'll see that the other components on the right, where you can see the whole patient, you'll notice that these viruses are administered to cells that are outside of the patient's body which Dr. Keeley will discuss in more depth next. In these ex vivo treatments, the cells are taken out and exposed to certain culture conditions. They are exposed to the virus, and then they're extended out and prepared for patient delivery. Gene therapy product manufacturing has many challenges, including process complexity, variability, and complexity of the components that are used in the manufacturer. The potential for microbial contamination during manufacturing, facility and process qualification and validation where testing and communication occurs regularly with the FDA, 
ensuring sterility of the living cell or virus drug product and the genetic stability of the drug product all the way through manufacture through patient treatment. All of these factors are built into the gene therapy product engineering, and all of these factors are figured in and investigated from the scientific perspective. Lastly, one of the hardest things to design for is the fact that every single patient has unique cells. Every single person is special and unique in terms of their genetic identity, and also previous treatments that a patient may receive, may have received in their disease treatment may affect how these cells behave during manufacturing. Now, there's a lot of progress that has been made. Science is working hard to address manufacturing capacity to alleviate bottlenecks for research and commercial development, and manufacturing capacity for gene therapy vectors is expanding in the United States. New research is enhancing the number of vectors that can be produced from cells, new bioreactors are being developed, and new methods are being investigated for purifying vectors. Now, where does the FDA sit in this? Imagine that there are two roads that are headed towards a new gene therapy product. The FDA works to be the safety divider or the median between the risks of a new product and the clinical benefits. Understanding risks and potential benefits as a gene therapy product moves towards approval is a long road through the clinical trial process. Everyone, including patients, researchers, industry, and the FDA want to see new and safe drug products available to people who need these therapies. This is an exciting time in gene therapy, and we anticipate seeing an unprecedented number of clinical studies and new gene therapy products. Here are two columns with examples of recently approved gene therapy products. On the left are CAR keys for select B cell cancers made from ex vivo modified cells with retroviruses, which was our second manufacturing example. And on the right are in vivo AAV drugs for genetic conditions, which was our first manufacturing example. Luxperna is for a type of genetic blindness, and Zolgesma is for early onset SMA1, a devastating and fatal disease in infants. The FDA evaluates every drug product during clinical development, which you see here in this phase series, through licensing and after licensing when a product reaches the market. We do so by working in teams of experienced medical doctors, scientists, statisticians, and pharmacists. In each phase, the sponsor of a clinical trial submits additional data to support the safety and efficacy. The FDA reviews the scientific data and responds to the results of clinical testing, patient adverse events, and changes in manufacturing. The FDA inspects facilities that manufacture gene therapy products during the final, final biologics applications license or the BLA stage and post approval. Because of the experience of team members and because the FDA sees all gene therapy products being developed in the United States, we are experts in understanding the product prior to administration to the patient, as shown in the left-hand column, and the gene therapy in the patient. We evaluate the product for extensive testing of sterility, potency, purity, and identity, control of manufacturing steps and materials, and that the vector and gene are designed to be safe, effective, and supported by data and we inspect manufacturing facilities at the BLA application and post-approval stage. The FDA also evaluates multiple factors, including that doses are appropriate to alleviate disease without compromising safety, that the gene therapy goes to the intended location, and that unintended genomic risks are limited, that patient immune responses are acceptable, and that the length of the response and that the long-term patient monitoring are accounted for. Dr. Keeley, our next speaker, will explain the importance of these in the patient next. As you've already seen and you know, gene therapy is an exciting field with major breakthroughs in recent years. While a majority of clinical trials, as you can see here, are still in phase one studies, some products are now gaining FDA approval and making it to patients. I hope that you've learned a bit more about the science behind the development of gene therapy products and how the science is used to put safety and efficacy first while reducing unreasonable risks to the patient. I also hope that this presentation is giving the tools to learn more and to ask more questions. Dr. Keeley will be providing his clinical perspective on the science behind gene therapy in the patient next. Please know that the FDA Center for Biologics is committed to reviewing gene therapy products and that we're excited to be an important component in the development of safe and effective drugs in the rare disease space. Please do mark your calendars for the next Norton and ASGCT series talk that will be on regulatory pathways to FDA and gene therapy. And now it's my pleasure to present 
Dr. Sen Keeley, who will provide a, pre a physician's and patient's perspective on the science behind gene therapy. Thank you very much, Dr. Lucas, and a really great overview. Thank you so much. So good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this second session um, on the science behind gene therapy. As Dr. Lucas has mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the process of undergoing therapy with gene therapy and try and walk you through some of the aspects and some of the things that a patient undergoing gene therapy might experience. So let's get started. Before we start actually getting into the nuts and bolts, Dr. Lucas talked earlier about in vivo and ex vivo gene therapy. So as a quick reminder, in vivo gene therapy, when is that? it's administered, it's administered directly to the patient and the target cells remain within the body. So this is very much like getting an injection or an infusion. It's a one-time therapy uh, for that specific treatment. On the other hand, ex vivo gene therapy, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today because from an administration perspective, it's a little more complicated. In ex vivo gene therapy, there are two real main steps. The first is the target cells are removed from the patient's body, and we'll talk about the ways that that happens in a moment. <clears throat> They're then sent off to a manufacturing or processing facility, uh, which is a, a laboratory. Uh, there they are altered, and they are then returned back to the patient and administered to the patient in that way. So let's go through that in a little more detail. Now, here I have an overview of the entire treatment um, journey for gene therapy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight a few areas uh, as we talk through them. So I'm going to start over here. First of all, as with everything that we do, the center of everything we do is the patient and the patient's family. And, and this is really absolutely critical uh, that we make sure the patient knows what's going on. So the first thing uh, that will happen is the patient then needs to be screened uh, and there needs to be preparation and consent occurring so that we know what's going to happen to the patient. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Once that's been achieved, the patient then comes into the treatment center for those cells to be collected. Now, the cells are collected in a variety of ways and that depends on the specific therapy, the specific disease and the target cells. So it may be um, a, a blood draw it may be an apheresis, which is an extended blood draw, and that may or may not have additional drugs required to what's called mobilize the cells from the bone marrow. So that's encouraging some of the cells from the bone marrow to come into the circulation uh, where they can then be harvested. It may include a bone marrow harvest and a variety of, of other mechanisms, but essentially those cells are then harvested. Once those cells have been harvested, they are packed into a transport container. Now, this transport container, uh, you can see up here on the far right-hand side, is preconditioned. And what that means is it's prepared. It's cooled down to the correct temperature. The paperwork is all uh, prepared. And the, it is packaged up carefully in such a way that those cells will transport as efficiently as possible. They also undergo quality controls to ensure the correct paperwork is carried out the correct patient cells are with the correct paperwork and they're going to the right place. Those cells are then transported to the manufacturing facility and this transport is incredibly important. Very often these cells may have a short period of time and that can be hours to days, sometimes a little bit longer, whereby they can be out of the body and out of any form of culture medium. So this transport aspect is critically important. Once they get to the manufacturing facility, they are received and very often go into quarantine where they may need to be checked. There are a variety of tests that may need to be done on them. Are they the right cells? Are there enough of them? Is the concentration sufficient? Are the cells in good enough condition um, to be manipulated? In Europe, there are also requirements for certain adventitious agent testing, which means certain infections need to be tested for. And then they go into the manufacturing process, and we'll talk about that a little more as we go on. So let's move on to the next one here. So the first steps within gene therapy, even before the patient gets to the point of having a needle put in, having cells removed, 
it's critically important to remember this is a new and a developing form of medicine. And as such, we are still learning. And because of this, we need to be careful. We need to go slowly and we need to do everything in a measured way so that we don't make any mistakes and we don't put anyone at risk. And this is why the FDA, the other regulatory agencies, companies, academics, physicians, and clinicians are all very, very careful about ensuring that the right patients receive this treatment. Gene therapy is not appropriate for all diseases. We're starting to learn more and more about what gene therapy works for. And we, as we start to do that, we start being able to expand on the types of therapies. But at the moment, it is a relatively small group of therapies that gene therapy is appropriate for. Dr. Lucas used the word monogenic with a single genetic defect. And this is what all of the approved products and most of the products in development are still for these diseases that have a single gene defect. So if a patient feels that they may be appropriate for gene therapy, the first port of call is their treating clinician. Go and have a word with the treating clinician. Understand the disease. Understand what the suitability of that patient is. With gene therapy, there is, you may be appropriate for, for treatment in terms of a disease, but the therapy may only work at certain stages of the disease and that may relate to the type of vector and other things which we'll cover in a moment. It's also important to discuss the benefits and the risks. As I said, this is new therapy, and we don't understand all of the risks yet, and we're trying very much to control them as we go along. And if the patient and the clinician then decide it's appropriate, this may result in a referral to a treatment center. Not every clinician is able to administer gene therapy, and it may be that the patient needs to be referred to a hospital uh, in, in another part of the country, in another country, or even just in another department. If the patient is accepted for gene therapy, there are a number of caveats that need to be taken into account, one of which is, as we're still learning, the patient may need to be willing to take part in a clinical trial. And clinical trials are critically important so we can really understand what's happening, what we're doing, and are these therapies better than other therapies out there at the moment? The patient may need to travel to participate also, as I've already mentioned. And then the need to have long-term follow-up is absolutely critical, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So to give you an idea of the types and the, the number of gene therapies that are currently in development, at the moment, as of uh, a few weeks ago, there were 266 gene and gene-modified cell therapy developers developing in rare diseases. Now, many of these are developing for more than one indication. So you can get an impression that there are a lot of, of therapies that are being developed for the rare disorders out there. And this will continue to grow as we learn more about these therapies. So in order to be able to understand, to know where to go to find out if a gene therapy may be appropriate, I've put a list of places that you can go, and these uh, lists are available on all of the relevant websites from clinical trials to the FDA, National Institutes of Health, ASGCT, and NORD. And they will be able to give you an, an idea as to if there is a, a trial ongoing in the type of disease that you're interested in. And so as uh, you've already been told, these slides will be made available afterwards. So uh, you can have a look at these and do some work and look. So the patient's been accepted for treatment. <laughs> and the first thing they do is they come into the treatment center and they'll need to undergo a number of assessments. The first is the inclusion criteria. Is the patient appropriate for the therapy? Uh, are they in the, the correct part of their disease? Um, and it may even be that a number of these, these diseases have various genetic um, abnormalities, and so there may be changes. And a gene therapy may only address one genetic defect, even if it's as part of three or four that cover that disease. And so these things may need to be looked at. Very importantly, the treatment explanation and a chance to ask, ask and answer questions. It's critically important to understand the entire process. And then comes the consenting process. Informed consent is absolutely critical, and the patient will be asked to sign a number of consent forms covering the entire treatment and follow-up. And then clinical evaluation, and this will include blood tests, 
you know, um, physical examinations, etc., plus very often other imaging and other relevant testing. As I've already mentioned, uh, there may be required uh, additional genetic testing and things like that. And only then do we get into the harvesting of the cells, as we talked about already. So you can see there's still quite a bit to do before the treatment starts. Now, Dr. Lucas has already talked about um, the, the delivery of gene therapy and the various vectors, and she's talked about adenoviruses and a variety of other vectors. And you can see here, this is a fairly substantial list. Now, it's important to realize that these are viral vectors. And I've seen some questions from people um, earlier on talking about other forms of delivery. And there are some non-viral approaches which are starting to be used, but many of them are still very much in development. And these will include things like sonoporation, electroporation, soluporation, and a variety of others. Um, and we don't have time to be able to cover those here, but we will be able to cover those other non-viral delivery mechanisms in future uh, webinars. So this gives you an idea about the vectors. Now, uh, Dr. Lucas touched on this earlier. The different vectors are used for different, re different reasons, and there is one main division between the two, and this is integration. So let's talk very briefly about integration, and Dr. Lucas has already mentioned this before. The first group is integrating vectors, and these are things like gamma retrovirus, lentivirus, these types of viruses. And what they do is they take their payload directly to the nucleus, and the nucleus is essentially the brain center of the cell. And there, the payload is transferred into and integrated into the genome, and as such is transferred to all new daughter cells. And so if you can think about uh, many diseases that may affect the precursor blood cells, severe um, combined immunodeficiency syndrome, Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, um, beta thalassemia, um, various things, metachromatic leukodystrophy, things like that uh, will require a consistent correction throughout the patient's life. And so an integrating vector like this allows for that to happen. And so every new lot of cells that's created will have that genetic correction in it. And that's compared to the non-integrating, such as an AAV, and there are very many others. Now, a non-integrating vector will deliver its payload into the cell, and in the cell it will get ex expressed, but it will not get integrated into the genome. And so what happens is it stays active as long as that cell is active. But that cell, if it divides or changes, that transfer of that genetic material will not happen to any daughter cells. And so these types of therapies are used more for cells that are not replicating very rapidly that you don't tend to turn over. These might be liver cells. These might, might be neural cells, things like that that stick around for a long time. So the choice of vector is, is dependent on a number of things. One, the effect and the duration of the effect, the target cell, uh, the ability to aim, and a variety of other things like that. So <clears throat> just because you have one therapy, you may have different types of vectors depending on how it's been designed. So the patient's gone, and if we think back to the first graphic, the patient has had their cells taken, the cells have been packaged, and they've been sent off to the laboratory or to the manufacturing facility. Um, that takes us up to here, where they are transported. Once they um, arrive, they undergo a quality check, which we've mentioned already, and then they go into the actual manufacturing, where they are joined with the vector. And Dr. Lucas has talked to us about that, about how the vector is manufactured, uh, the challenges of the, the enormous numbers of these cells that are required to treat patients. And once these are all combined together, uh, they're prepared into the final product, and that final product undergoes the testing that Dr. Lucas talked about uh, already, and that is then considered the drug product. So let's go back here. We've gotten to the point where all the testing is done. Um, the cells may be cryopreserved, so they may be frozen, uh, and freezing these cells allows them then to be transported uh, or held if the patient's not ready to be treated. Some of these diseases, the patients are incredibly ill, 
and they may not be able to be treated immediately. So we need to be able to store the cells, so they may need to be frozen down. Um, they, when the patient is ready, they are transported to the hospital, and they may be stored for a short period of time in the hospital as the patient is being prepared. Now, when I say the patient is being prepared, we go back here to the patient. And very often, in certain types of these uh, diseases and therapies, the patient will need to undergo conditioning. And so if you think about um, we have taken um, some blood precursor cells, so stem cells from, from the bone marrow that go to make blood, and we're going to put those back in, but we need to make space in the bone marrow. And so the patient may need to go undergo some conditioning, uh, like myeloablation. So killing some of the cells in the bone marrow to make space for these new cells to be given. This is also given in the CAR-T therapies that Dr. Lucas talked about. So the patient may need to undergo a degree of conditioning. Once the conditioning is finished and uh, the drug product is prepared, remember I said it might be frozen, and so it needs to be thawed, and it needs to be thawed in a controlled way. It's then administered to the patient, and the patient is treated, and it may be given as an intravenous infusion. It may be given as an infusion into the cerebrospinal fluid. It may be given as a direct injection into the brain, and it will vary depending on the specific condition. The patient is then monitored, and the monitoring will obviously depend on the type of disease and the therapy that's given, and the monitoring may be a number of hours up to a number of weeks. Patients with uh, some of the inborn errors of metabolism um, may find that they have to undergo quite a bit of conditioning and so may need to stay in hospital for a few weeks before they can be released. Also, it's important that these patients are monitored, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. And then, you know, the, the long-term follow-up really starts, and this is, this is critically important. So I've already mentioned this a few times, and it, it, it's important to remember this is a developing science still. And sometimes the treatment outcomes are not absolutely predictable, much as with little white tablets, some people respond better than others. With gene therapy, we're starting to learn more and more. And so the time to onset of effect may be variable. If we are putting cells in that are going to repopulate within the bone marrow, that may take a number of months for those cells to get, find their way into the bone marrow, to attach in the bone marrow, and start forming daughter cells. So we need to follow those patients up and make sure that the effect is coming. And that effect may be gradual. You may start seeing a change, and then a little more, and a little more, and a little more. The entire final response may also be variable. We see this in things like um, hemophilias and uh, bleeding disorders whereby some people are able to go off um, blood administration whereas others aren't. The treatment duration and the need for retreatment, this is really important. Uh, for integrating vectors, we talked about those earlier that get integrated, we assume and we think the patient will only need one treatment and then for the rest of their lives they'll have sufficient amounts of cells. But we've only got about 18 to 20 years worth of data on certain indications, so we don't really know. And this is the importance of following these patients up. For some of the other therapies that are maybe given to cells in the liver and central nervous system, uh, we expect that those cells will not turn over much and it will be sufficient. But if they lose just a few cells, it may take uh, whatever treatment is, we're talking about may drop it below a certain level, and there is a possibility patients may require treatment in the future. And this will vary from treatment to treatment. We just don't know yet. And then the long-term effects and complications, once again, things we don't completely understand yet. And this is the reason for being able to follow patients up for a long period of time to learn. So having been treated is not the end of the story. There's still quite a lot to go on. Um, and there are certain important things to be aware of and to discuss with the treating center. Things like limitations on blood and organ donation. Chances are it's not a problem, but we don't know. And so very often patients will be limited from donating blood or donating organs. And so it may be a good idea for a patient to wear medical ID jewelry to inform centers of this in case they get into an accident. 
This brings us to the next point of notification of the treatment center of any illnesses or hospitalization. If the patient is hospitalized or becomes ill, not at or near the treatment center, it's really important that the treating center is aware of what happened so that they can log it and they can register it, even if it doesn't seem to be associated with the actual original disease that was treated, you know, a broken leg versus you know, a, a, a systemic disease, it doesn't matter. It's really important that they're aware of that and they can report it to the authorities. There may be other specific requirements, and these will depend on uh, the specific type of disease uh, and the, the way it was treated. Uh, there will also need to be regular contact with the treatment center um, immediately after the treatment and for months to years afterwards. And this brings us to long-term follow-up. As I said, we're still just learning about the long-term effects of gene therapy. So most and well, all approved products are required to follow their patients up for a long period of time, very often at least 15 years. And so there will be a variety of mechanisms available to follow these patients up, usually things like registries. <clears throat> and this is critically important that patients do maintain that follow-up, particularly for children that are treated perhaps as babies. As we all know, they become children and then they become a strange thing called an adolescent. Uh, and then they revert back to the human form as an adult much later on. And trying to convince adolescents um, to call up or even go and see a clinical treatment center once a year can often be very challenging, but it's really important that we continue to follow these patients up. So hopefully this has given you a bit of an overview as to what a patient can expect when undergoing gene therapy. There are a lot of other details around it, but hopefully this has been a nice broad uh, overview for everybody. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your questions, and I'm going to hand uh, the the call back to Katie. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lucas, and thank you, Dr. Keeley, for those informative presentations. Um, you've covered a number of critical points that are really adding to our understanding of gene therapy. So we have an active audience, and we've been collecting questions from participants throughout the webinar and also during the registration period. So now we'll move to a question and answer session. Um, the team is going to try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Um, if we don't get to your question, feel free to email us at education at rarediseases.org. Um, and one caveat, we've gotten a lot of questions about people's personal conditions. We've had people sending us some of their records. Um, we want to help you in every way that we can, but NORD's not a clinical provider, so we're not able to interpret um, test results and medical records. And then we've gotten a, a bunch of questions about asking us, are there gene therapies available for specific conditions or if clinical trials are underway for specific conditions. So um, I've, I've pulled up this slide again that has the link that you can use to find those information, and those slides are being um, updated regularly. And we will be sending the slides and the recording of the webinar out to everybody who registered. So with that, um, I will move to our audience questions. Um, and the first one um, I'll direct to Dr. Lucas. Um, uh, and two parts to this question. First, how long does gene therapy take to get FDA approval? And then part two, does the length of time for a clinical trial depend on the type of gene therapy, or are they all about the same amount of time with three phases each? Okay, so that's a, it's a really product dependent question. And um, as Dr. Keeley has just said, that the science is very much still evolving. So I'd like to say that um, the first approved CAR T in 2017, the FDA first began to engage with the, you know, parent early technology back in 1990. And there were several changes and improvements and reiterations um, that go into a product's development. Um, so these are long paths um, in terms of the science. By the time that the FDA sees a gene therapy um, a potential product, it may already have you know five or ten or more years of science behind it before we're engaging with it. 
Um, as we have, um, as our knowledge has grown in the field, things are moving much more quickly. Um, I think that industry and academic centers are seeing the promise and we're better understanding the science and technology. So I do think that timeline is shrinking significantly and um, we may see things come and uh, exit into the, the BLA phase and the, the post-market phase maybe in five years. Um, but it can be a long path. There are a lot of things that happen in terms of modifying dosing, manufacturing changes, and a lot of things that go on behind the scenes before those products do make it into the commercial marketplace. Great. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And yeah, it's an exciting time and um, definitely a, a, an evolution um, and, and a lot of changes, I'm sure, at FDA. Um, a, uh, dealing with all the new therapies that are coming onto the market. Um, next question, Dr. Keeley, um, somebody's asking, is gene therapy possible for adults? And uh, is gene therapy good for a patient who's in the late phase of a disease, or is it only good for a patient in the early phase? Thank you very much for that. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll address the easy part first. Uh, is gene therapy appropriate for adults? Um, once again, the caveat is it, de it depends on the actual disease, but absolutely yes. Um, you know, we've treated a number of adults in a number of different indications, um, so just being an adult doesn't, doesn't preclude you. In terms of uh, the stages of disease, uh, once again, it depends on the disease, but very often if you think about a disease, and a rare disease that perhaps uh, is related to, for example, um, a lack of an enzyme or something like that. The early stages of the disease, you tend not to get uh, changes in the body, uh, and these might be, you know, um, breakdown products that, that aren't being gotten rid of, et cetera, et cetera. And typically, uh, the earlier the stage of the disease and the less permanent changes, the better the results. So if you think about it, uh, gene therapy can theoretically correct a disease state, but it not yet can it turn back time or undo damage that's already been done. So once again, depends on the disease, uh, but in general, uh, the earlier we can get to treat patients, uh, the better the outcome tends to be. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, um, Dr. Lucas, I have a question here. What are the most common eligibility criteria for gene therapy? So, I would direct eligibility to Dr. Keeley because this is something that would be discussed with a clinical provider. Um, this is something that the FDA definitely does review um, when we are working with sponsors. But um, as Dr. Keeley is a clinician, I will direct it to him. Thank you. Uh, Thanks very much, Dr. Lucas. I think this is, this is a little bit like uh, how long is a piece of string. Um, I think it depends on the indication um, as, to, as to what the, the, the criteria are for, for a patient. Um, typically, I think the first thing is uh, the disease that's being treated, there must be uh, a known and a gene therapy in development for it. So we must know um, that we can address it. It's a single gene, ideally. Um, the gene is of a size that can be corrected, and correcting that gene changes the outcome of the disease. There are other diseases where they may be multigenic, things like that. Um, so, so first of all, ensuring those criteria are met. Um, and then, uh, as we've mentioned before, um, ensuring that there is no permanent damage uh, as a result of the disease. Um, or the permanent damage that's been done will not negatively affect the patient's outcome. Um, and then it's going to be down to the specific indication and the specific the way the therapy has been, has been designed, the vector, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. Oh, all right. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Lucas, I have a, another question here. It says, when reviewing gene therapy for clinical use, what factors are looked at besides the safety of the product? Absolutely. So, I'll say that every indication and every product, you know, is its, its own story. 
And that's what we think about when we are reviewing these products on teams where we have um, pharmacology toxicology reviewers with a clinical reviewer and a, a product or CMC reviewer. Um, so we consider a lot of things. Um, to us, it's not a certain number of patients that will benefit is not, you know, essential. We consider applications that are for a single patient um, to many patients, although we see a lot of rare disease in the gene therapy space. Um, we do consider um, the risks here. So if there is a rare disease that already has a pretty safe and effective um, treatment available to it, um, we do consider that um, when we're reviewing the product um, to be potentially used in, in um, clinical studies. Um, but then, you know, there are people that perhaps don't respond to something that's already on the market that, that's safe for many people, but some people don't respond. And so some of these gene therapy products are options for non-responders. And of course, the most important thing is we are looking to see if the benefits are outweighing the risks. You know, gene therapy products are very unique. They're very complex. There's a lot of variability in there. However, with some of these rare diseases, they are extremely devastating and they can be devastating very quickly. And so we are always evaluating the risks that um, are potentially there for a patient or a study subject. And if that is going to outweigh um, the risks, the risks associated with it and the potential disease outcome. Great, thank you. So sounds like a very comprehensive approach where you're really always um, weighing many factors and weighing risks and, and benefits. Um, next question, um, are the risks of gene therapy and all the possible treatment responses known before a patient receives gene therapy. Um, Dr. Killer, are you able to field that one? So again, the, are the risks of gene therapy and the possible treatment responses known before a patient is given gene therapy? Um, yeah, I, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is a really, really good question. Um, and essentially, in, in, in a short answer, no, they are not. Um, what we try and do before any patients undergo therapy, um, the aim is to understand the therapy and what it's going to do in terms of the effect that it's going to have on an organism. And there are a variety of ways that we can get an indication as to how it's going to respond. Some of them will be some of the early R&D work within a laboratory using cells and these will be human cells in a petri dish in a lab and understand how they, how they affect that. There's a possibility to model uh, the way certain cells react as to what that might cause for the body, and that's called in silico modeling, so modeling within a computer. Um, there are animal studies done where the cells are tested uh, and the, the gene therapy is tested within the animals. Um, and the aim here is really to build up as solid and as definitive an idea of the treatment response as we can. Um, and there will also be information from um, the clinical use in terms of any mutations, any changes, understanding the, the normal um, way that the, the, the disease progresses. But at the end of the day, we try and get to the point of being as certain as possible uh, and this is a discussion with the regulators also, um, and we will go to them and we'll speak to them and, and we will sit down with them and say, right, this we understand, this we understand, this we understand, and these things we're not entirely sure of, but we think they will happen because of X, Y, and Z. And then it becomes, uh, we go to the point where we can find out a very nothing much more, and then we move into, into human trials. So the first humans that do get the therapy, no, we don't know absolutely for certain what the outcome will be, but we have a really, really good idea. Great. Well, that's very helpful. Um, well, we have so many questions and so little time. I'll throw the next one out to um, whoever wants to take this one on. Um, how can we better understand if a disease is a good candidate for gene therapy or gene editing? So I will say that, you know, you can go on clinicaltrials.gov and you can, you know, see what is currently available and, um, you know, follow that and see as, as new things become available in terms of clinical studies. 
Um, but there can be multiple approaches. It depends on the disease, but it may be a single disease could have a gene therapy approach and a gene editing approach, or it may even have a combination of a gene therapy slash gene editing approach, depending on the disease. Um, with gene therapy, you know, the field's a little more um, developed at this point in time. And typically, if you're delivering a specific gene payload, it's, it's more straightforward and a gene therapy, like with a viral vector delivery system, may make sense. But gene editing may be better for silencing a gene or targeting a very tiny region within a gene. Great. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but I'd like to thank um, Dr. Tiffany Lucas and Dr. Sven Keeley for really your excellent presentations and your informed responses to all the questions today. I'd also like to say a special thank you again to our sponsors at Amicus Therapeutics, Sarepta Therapeutics, Avro Bio, and Bluebird Bio, Bio for making the series possible. Uh, to all of our participants, uh, you're going to receive a short survey after the webinar, and we encourage you to complete it because it'll help us develop future webinars. So thank you all so very much for joining us, and have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you.